Hello and welcome to the Badger Talks podcast, the podcast that shares interviews with experts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison community about their work, research, and a little bit about what they're like as people. I'm your host, Buzz Kemper. Today, we're focusing on geography, and I'm happy to have as my guest, Jack Williams, Geography Department Chair and Professor at UW-Madison. Jack, thank you so much for being on the program. I am looking forward to learning a lot from what you're doing. And I want to start locally. You are doing, and I believe this is a, kind of a new thing, sediment studies on the, I don't know if it's the Madison area lakes or Wisconsin lakes, but tell me about what that study is and what it's telling you. Yeah, so all the lakes around us are what we call natural archives. They are just slowly accumulating mud year after year, decade after decade, you know, millennium after millennium. And as we know, the ice sheets around here melted back around, let's say, 10 to 15,000 years ago, earlier in the southern part of the state, later in the northern part of the state. And so each of these gives those muds and those sediments are natural records of everything that's lived in the lake and around the lake since the ice sheets pulled back. And so my research is looking at past climate change and then past ecological responses, how different species responded to that. And my, my work is kind of a mixture of old and new. On the classic old side, traditional side, we pull pollen grains out of those lake sediments and that tells us what kind of plants lived in or near the lake. And that kind of work people have been doing for 100 years now. There's, we actually ce celebrate our 100th birthday for this field of work uh, just a few years ago. But on the new side, we actually just got funding from the university to do the new kind of work, which is ancient DNA, pulling DNA fragments out of the mud to, to see not just what plants lived around there, but anything. Anything that lived in that lake is potentially a source of DNA. So there's a whole series of what we call cryptic species that we maybe couldn't detect traditionally. Now we can with these new methods. That's fascinating because I... I know a microscopic amount about uh, geology and how the different strata uh, tell us what's going on, both in terms of what kind of rock is there and in terms of fossils and so on and so forth. It sounds to me like you're able to do that exact same thing, but with lake sediments. Am I accurate? That's exactly right. I actually got my PhD in geology, and now I'm based in a geography department, as you know, here on campus. Yes. This, this confuses my parents all the time. You know, which are you? You know, <laughs> Right, right, right. And, and what I tell them is that geologists do time and geographers do space, and I do a bit of both. And so what I'm really interested in, this is kind of re relatively recent past, and the last ice age is a model system for understanding the climate change happening around us now, right? You know, climate change is happening. We're seeing biological systems trying to respond. We're seeing species move. We're seeing fires happen more frequently. And so the point being that we're moving towards a state of the climate system that we haven't seen in our human history. So we have to go to the geological record. In And as it turns out, the recent ice age, just a mere 20,000 years ago, mm -hmm. long by human standards, you know, a, an eye blank in geology standards, that's a really useful under, system for understanding things like when climate change, species move, and how species and communities responded to those past climate changes. Okay. Is the timeline that you're dealing with, it seems to me that it's going to be more, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's going to be a little more compressed than a geologist, because I would imagine that sediments change and and uh, and and accumulate uh you know their dna that's going to be a faster timeline than it is with rock is that correct yeah that's right if you could dive down to the bottom of the lake and collect the topmost centimeter an inch let's say of of mud that would represent maybe 10 years of history the most recent 10 years of history and as you go deeper down the sediment column like you said that'd be further and further back in time back to when that lake formed and um so, right, for a geologist, you know, they think on timescales of millions of years, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, totally different orders of magnitude. We're really focusing, to me, this really interesting time period where we're using geological methods, sediments, what we can pull out of the sediments, but the timescale which humans are arriving in the Americas, climates are changing, spruce trees are dying out in Wisconsin and migrating north, other trees like oak are moving in. So it's, it's this intersection of the geology and the human timescale that I really love about it. And it's this time period that, that geologists call the Quaternary, the Fourth Age, which is kind of an old naming system, but it's one we still use today. Okay, wow, fascinating. Now, what is the sediment, what does it primarily consist of? I, we know it's going to be decaying plants and decaying animals, but I imagine it's other stuff, stuff that 
comes down with rainfall, stuff that falls in. What is the general makeup of this sediment? Yeah, you can parse it a couple different ways. One is what we call exogenous versus endogenous. Things that started outside the lake that got washed into the lake, like whatever washes off the surrounding hillside or blows in through from the wind. And then endogenous, things that are produced inside the lake. So any little organisms, you know, the, the food webs, plankton, living in the lake, whatever lives and dies in the lake. And then in terms of winds, what winds up in the sediments, you'll get right the, what we call the organic component, anything that was kind of once living. You get the inorganic component, like little bits of shell, like little bits of you know, bivalves or mollusk fragments. And then you get the, the mineral component, the rocks, the ground up dust and so forth. And that's kind of a good three part breakdown. And you know, our field has gone from microfossils, like little pollen grains that are just you know tenths of millimeters, or hundreds of millimeters in size. And now we're going to the molecular scale. We're actually going to like individual DNA fragments or individual chemical compounds, and we can pull those out of the lake sediment as well. And so my field is what we call multi-proxy research. Each proxy is some signal of past climates and past ecosystems. So we can do radiocarbon dating to figure out how old those sediments are. We can use the pollen to tell us what kind of plants lived around the lake. We can pull charcoal out of the lake sediments, and that tells us when fires burned in the watershed around there. Mm. The isotope geochemists can do isopic analyses that tell us something about water balance and how much that water is evaporating. There's these organic biomarkers that are all different indicators of temperature, and now the ancient DNA community. So it's just amazing. You just think it's a cubic centimeter of mud, mm -hmm. but all these different scientific communities are each trained to do it with different kind of analysis to pull a different kind of signal from that kind of data. Wow. Okay, now let's take that and let's now zoom out. And uh, this is kind of this is the stuff you've been doing locally here. How does that translate, and how does that relate to what is going on more globally? And uh, and I know you you happen to know a thing or two about that. <laughs> well, thanks. Right, and this gets back to what I was saying a moment ago, ago about you know geologists doing time and geographers doing space. Right. So each one of these sediment cores that we pull out, and I should tell you some stories about field work. But yeah. you know, each sediment core that we pull out is one place, one point in space, and it might be fifteen thousand years worth of or or longer worth of history. Right. So now you might say, well, we know that spruce trees lived in Devil's Lake 15,000 years ago. They're not there anymore. Now we have pine and oak. Now, if you had you know, networks of sites all over North America, what you can start to see is what happened is at the last ice age, we have spruce trees living down in Tennessee and Kentucky. As climates changed, ice sheets melt, those spruce populations start to move into Wisconsin and then move into Canada. So we can actually see the range movement of tree species driven by changing climates through this network of sites, each one of which is covering a different point in space. And so this is where my field you know, I'm really proud of my field is we've realized for a long time there's a lot of value in sharing our data. Each one of these lake sediment records is, it takes years of work by specialists, right? Yeah. But if we pool our data together, we can start to get the big picture of global scale responses of species and biodiversity to global scale climate change. Okay. And what, what have you, I'm almost afraid to ask this question, but what, what is the picture like at this point? I, we've heard, we've heard everything from you know, we're going to hit the tipping point in a few years to we've already hit it to, you know, um, th there, there may be solutions, you know, maybe not. You know, how, how what, what is the situation as far as you can see through your research with where climate change is and what we can do about it? I'll just say I've done a lot of climate change communications. I've done a lot of thinking about climate change in my time. And it's a really tough one to get the message right on because you don't want to swing too far to either way. Actually, you don't want to say, well, there's nothing to worry about. It's not a problem. You don't want to go down the denialist path. You also don't want to go down the path like we're all doomed. Like we have no hope, right? right. It's, it's in the middle. And the way I think about it is climate change is a big deal. What we have really learned from the last ice age, a global warming of six degrees Celsius, about 11 Fahrenheit, that transformed the world, that transformed Wisconsin. We see legacies of it all around us, vanished ice sheets, right? That's what a six degree global warming does. So it's a huge deal. At the same time, what well, we can see is that species have ways of adapting. They can move, they can migrate, they can persist. And actually a lot of my work is on the ground is how do we help forest managers, ecosystem managers help the species of today be prepared for the climate changes of today and tomorrow. So I think there's a lot of work, there's a lot of room for pragmatic optimism and solutions-based work, while at the same time saying, yeah, we have a big job ahead of us. And in general, the less climate change, the better. That's true too. Okay. I'm curious about 
I, I can't imagine that, uh, although maybe you did, but as a child, you said to yourself, you know, here's what I want to do. I want to do this research through geography of lake sediments, and I want to learn about long-term speciation and, and climate change and blah, blah, blah. How did you find yourself in this field? It's a great question. And of course, I, when I tell, tell my students, there's, there's a lot of like random chance, right? You make some plans, you have some ideas, and then things just happen and you go forward. I knew early on I wanted to be a scientist. I loved history. I loved archaeology. I was sort of the Indiana Jones generation. That was a formative movie for me back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a chance to do some field school and some, some courses with field work. And what I really dis discovered is that I liked the human history, but I loved was the geology, the going to the outcrops and starting to read the record. And, you know, one thing that's great about once you start to take some outdoors oriented classes, you start to get an eye for things you wouldn't see otherwise. And you look at a rock and it's like, oh, that's just a rock. But once you've been trained a little bit, like, oh, there's layering and there's structure and, and you can start to see these fossils and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy that process of discovery and learning. One of my hobbies is technical rock climbing. So mm -hmm. I actually love rock and I, and I get a very close look at it because I'm right there you know, yeah, trying, right. To, trying to figure it out. So here's a two part question. One is, why is what you're studying, why is it part of geography and not geology? Right. And then kind of morph into what is your day-to-day -day life like as not only a, a professor, but a department chair? Yeah, sure. So the geography, geology, I think one of the things I actually appreciate and enjoy most about being geography is what we call an intersectional discipline. It mm -hmm. has lots of crossover in all these different directions, mm -hmm. right? If you were like, I'm also a biogeographer and that crosses over to ecology. You know, you have people in what, you know, if you read the, the definition of, of geography in the dictionary, it says, basically anything happening on the surface of the earth, you know, rocks, people, societies. Oh, is that all? <laughs> if it's surface of the earth, it's fair wow. game for geography. It's oh my God. So it's very broad, but what, what that lets you do is it lets you have a lot of freedom in which directions you want to pursue. And so I'm looking at climate-driven ecological range shifts over broad scales using the geological record. And that's if I was in a climate department, atmospherics department, or a geology department, or an ecology department, I could only do one piece of that. And geography lets me do all parts of those put together. That's what I really like about that geography. That is terrific, yeah. yeah. So what is your day-to-day -day, uh, work life like? Well, certainly by <laughs> by being chair, now it's all email all the time, right? You know, it's a lot of the administrative work. But I think what, uh, what I think is fun to talk about this a little bit is that people don't know what a professor does, right? People think professors teach, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we do. That's probably, let's call it 40% of what we do. It's an important part, but another 40% is at least is research and discovery new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then of course the service and leadership and things like reviewing articles for journals and so forth. And what I think is so great about a university like UW Madison is this model if you have world-class scientists who are discovering new knowledge and that's that this discovery of knowledge side that's the research side and then the, the sharing of knowledge the transmission of knowledge so doing this mm -hmm. podcast today teaching in the classroom giving public lectures working with land managers i said all part of my job as a professor is both discover knowledge and then share knowledge any way i can to any audience i would find it useful so that's what i love best about this job terrific yeah and i really appreciate what we're able to do with these podcasts because i hope that the listener feels a fraction of the benefit that I do because every one of these makes me smarter. And that is an absolute wonderful thing. Uh, Jack Williams, what would you like to talk about that perhaps I have not asked the correct question to, to get there? Yeah, thanks. Well, it's been a great conversation. The one thing I would add, I guess another piece where the geography comes into play is, okay, so we now want to go from one individual site to many sites globally. Mm -hmm. This now gets into data science and information systems. Like how do you create systems for sharing data and platforms for that? So actually a lot of my kind of mid-career push now as I've gone for more field science and kind of, you know, that kind of work is trying to build coalitions of scientists to share our data together and creating data platforms for doing that and then creating governance models for how do we share data, how do we curate data and kind of work together on that. The resource I work with is called the Neotoma Paleoecology Database. If there's some online links, I can give you some links to share that are some fun data visualizations, like, you know, animated maps of trees moving north from the last ice age. So to me, it's really fun, but there's, again, making, using data science and new ways of seeing data as another way of communicating and sharing information with both research and public audiences. Mm. So are we eventually going to see plants and animals that are currently in Kentucky or Arizona 
Uh, are they eventually going to be in Wisconsin if this keeps going? I think we're all watching armadillos, right? You're like, when? <laughs> yeah, do I, when right, do I, you know, right, right. When do I? When when do I see armadillos in my yard? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Right. Yeah. That is what's happening. That yeah. when climate change species move, we're going to see some species move into Wisconsin. Maybe we're in Illinois or for points further south, and then there might be some species at the southern edge of their range limits that might start to depart Wisconsin and mm -hmm. maybe die out locally but maybe move farther north. And so both sides will happen. And we, we'll see that as local transformation and some kinds loss or surprise. But from a species perspective, that's kind of what they do. And that's how they handle yeah. changing environments. Wow, amazing. And as a final thought, what do you like to do? What are you all about when you're not doing all of this heavy you know, research and sharing of information and uh, being a department chair? Like I said, I'm a rock climber. What, uh, what do you like to do? Well, I have rock climbed back in the day, and I guess I would say okay. I'm going down through the aging athlete trajectory where I played lacrosse in college, I played ultimate frisbee for a number of years, and now it's pickleball. Pickleball is my new sport of passion of choice. Started about a year ago. I've been really enjoying it. Oh my gosh. I'm working on a project with a young woman who's probably, I think she's around 30 or something like that, and uh, and she she's loving pickleball that's her that's her new you know big thing so i don't think it's an age thing i feel like uh, people people of all ages are enjoying that and that uh, that sounds terrific um thank you so much this has been very very informative and you've you've put a lot of information into good focus for us thank you i've had a fun time today this has been great you've been listening to the badger talks podcast I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Jack Williams. Please browse our previous episodes for other topics that may be of interest to you. The Badger Talks podcast is a creation of UW Connects and produced at Audio for the Arts Recording Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. Our music is composed by Bill Purdy and performed by the UW Marching Band. I'm Buzz Kemper. Thank you for listening.